Hi everyone! Welcome to um, Saturday Story Time with me. Uh, you'll probably not see the little ones around; they're kind of sleeping. So I'm gonna wait just a little bit before I start, just in case someone wants to join in. And I hope you're having a wonderful weekend and uh, being safe and all that wonderful stuff. And I hope it's a great extended Memorial Day weekend. All right, so I'm gonna start off with. Um, one of these books, it's Pickusville. Our kind of theme for today is tall tales and stories, which I really do enjoy. So Pickusville, a tall tale retold and illustrated by Stephen Kellogg. Okay. <clears throat> Back in the rugged uh, pioneer days when Pickusville was a baby, his kinfolk decided that New England was becoming entirely too crowded. So they piled up the covered wagons and headed west. The clan considered settling in East Texas until Bill's ma noticed a homesteader putting up a shack about 50 miles away. Another crowded neighborhood, she grumbled. Let's push on. Is there in their covered wagon? You don't know where that is? That's a longhorn? You're from Texas, you know. If not, well, it's okay. Let's go. It's the wide expanse of the prairie and their covered wagons. As they crossed the Pecos River, Bill threw out a fishing line, but when a Texas trout nibbled, Bill was yanked overboard. Oh, no. He was towed far downstream, and he would have drowned if for an old coyote hadn't grabbed him. Her family adopted Bill and taught him the ways of the wild creatures. Oh, she is a coyote or coyote, depending on how you want to pronounce that. He's adopted into that family. Wonder how that's gonna affect a young boy growing up with wild animals. By the time Bill had outgrown his britches, that's pants by the way, he felt like he was a member of the pack. He, get, he loved to romp with the Coyote Brothers, and as he grew, old, grew older, he sometimes played with the bighorn sheep. Big jumping. One day, a drifter named Chuck stumbled upon Bill while he was taking a nap. He asked Bill what he meant by snoozing in the bush without his trousers. Again, pants. He tried to explain that he was a coyote. Horse feathers, said Chuck. You're a Texan like me. Bill decided to give the life as a Texan a try. He borrowed Chuck's extra clothes and peppered him with questions. See, he's cleaning up. I'm giving him a horse and he's running around. To tell you the truth, said Chuck, most Texans are flea bitten outlaws. And the worst of them are in Hell's Gulch Gang. And, but even they would, would be okay if they become ranchers and herd the longhorns that wander hereabouts. Remember those cows that we saw at the beginning? Ranching sounds good to Bill, and he headed to Hell's Gulch determined to recruit the gang. He's walking out with Chuck. But Bill's plans were interrupted when he was ambushed by a giant rattlesnake. Oh, no. When Bill dodged the snake's fangs, it slipped in its coils, slipped its coils around him. The snake squeezed hard, but Bill squeezed harder, and he didn't let up until every drop of poison was out of the reptile, leaving it skinny as a rope and as mild as a goldfish. They went from big bad rattlesnake to teeny tiny little rope snake. Then before Bill could catch his breath, he was tackled by a critter that was part grizzly, part puma, which is cougar, and part, part gorilla and part tarantula. They rustled up and down the canyon and kicked up quite a dust storm until the monster finally became so dizzy it quit. Oh, 
That's a pretty imaginative monster that Bill has encountered. Nobody ever got, nobody had ever tangled with these two varmints and lived to tell the tale. So when Bill met up with the Hell's Gulch gang, they were thunderstruck. Who's the boss of this outfit, said Bill. Mm, I was, said Gunsmith, but now you is. Bill told the gang that he was going to turn every last one of them into respectable ranch hands. But the men claimed that Texas cattle were just too ordinary, uh, ordinary to even put up with ranching. See, Bill meeting up with the, the gang, which is very true. Bill had sudden inspiration and he approached the longhorn that was sulking nearby. Just as the bull whirled around to trample him, Bill snagged him with the rattlesnake and yanked him with all his might. <coughs> Cattle roping had just been invented. Yep. Bill scared that bull out of its skins with a blood curdling coyote howl that embarrassed the creatures. The creature, the embarrassed creature, high-tailed it off to grow a new coat, while Bill cut up the hide into strips and passed them, passed them out to the men to use as lassos. See? He's using the hide that it got scared off as lassos and ropes. See, he's getting all of those other longhorns about. Then cowboys and cattle tangled in a rough and tumble hullabaloo that was remembered to this day as the first Western Rodeo. When it ended, the gang declared that they would be cowboys forever, and they promised to help Bill round up every steer in Texas. Let's see, rough and tumble. Cowboys getting those cattle rustled up. Bill needed a horse to ride in the big roundup. Well, said Chuck, there's a wild stallion in the mountains that some folks call Lightning. Others think the name's Widowmaker suits her, him better. But no matter what you call him, he's the fastest, most beautiful horse in the world. Bill went off in search of Lightning, and as soon as he saw him, Bill knew he'd found the horse for him. He finds Lightning. You think it's going to be easy for him to get a hold of him? Bill chased lightning north of the Arctic Circle and south to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Some pretty far, far distances and extreme weathers. Finally, he cornered the stallion and jumped into his back. Lightning exploded from the canyon, leaping and bucking across three states. When Bill began to sing in a language he had heard from his coyote family, he sang of his admiration of the stallion's strength and promised him a lifetime of partnership and devotion. When Bill was done singing, he offered the horse his freedom, but Lightning chose to follow him forever. When Pecos Bill and Lightning leading them, the cowboys whooped across the state of Texas, rounding up every last steer. But their high spirits collapsed when they were faced with the job of driving the enormous herd back and forth between the summer and winter ranges. To silence their grumbling, Bill set up the Perpetual Motion Ranch in Pinnacle Peak, which was so bit high that the top remained in winter while the spring and autumn while in spring and autumn turned into summer at the base. Look at all of those longhorns that they've got. And there, there's Pinnacle Peak. A team of prairie dogs helped Bill fence off the mountains so the cattle could wander through the seasons unattended. Bill's plan worked fine, except that Pinnacle Peak was so steep, the steers fell off 
right off when there was a breeze. The men had to work harder than ever carrying the cattle back up the hill. It does seem kind of slippery and dangerous. Bill solved that problem by inventing steers with very short legs on one side of their body. Even in a windstorm, these, cat these cattle could stand securely on the slope as long as they kept their short-legged sides uphill. <laughs> See? Now the men of Perpetual Motion Ranch had all kinds of free time, and Bill became, uh, became known as the world's greatest cowboy. Look, it's all of their free time because he invented some short-legged cows. But the high point of Bill's life came when Slewfoot Sue passed, passed by on the back of a catfish. Bill was instantly in love, and he hollered proposal of marriage. Sue agreed on two conditions. First, Bill had to buy her a wedding dress with a puzzle. And second, he had to, had to let her ride lightning to the ceremony. Slewfoot Sue on the back of a big old catfish. The first quest was easy. Bill galloped to Dallas and bought, a bought back the fanciest bustle dress in the city. Sue's second request wasn't so simple. How do you think Lightning's going to react to someone else sitting on? Although Sue Fitsu was the first rate rider, the moment her bustle touched the saddle, she was blasted skywards. Goodness. Yep. Lightning didn't seem to like that very much, huh? Sue soared around the moon and began the long descent to Earth. Shot her all the way up to the moon. See, there she is. She landed squarely on her bustle, but as quick as Bill was, he couldn't get to her before she bounced back to outer space. Time and time again, Sue hit the ground and rocketed back towards the stars. There's Sue coming down, but she's gonna bounce right back up. Sue probably would have sailed back and forth forever if Bill hadn't lassoed a tornado to help him catch his bouncing bride. The pair of them clung to the careening storm until it blew over, blew itself over California. To Bill's amazement, he and Sue landed on top of his Ma and Pa's wagon. That is pretty coincidental, huh? Bill couldn't believe that his kinfolks were still searching for a home site. He told them that they could spend the rest of their days roaming, but they'd never find a place to equal Texas. Everyone returned to Bill's ranch uh, for a winding of a re family reunion, and today their descendants are still there, happily herding cattle. everyone. Hope you enjoyed that one. I love anything that Stephen Kellogg does. Besides his illustrations, the stories are always amazing. Definitely one to have one in your library. All right, so we're going to start out with another book. Again, like most of these books, they're from my childhood. This one definitely was. Um, it's kind of a rendition of Cinderella, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Right, it's called The Rough Face Girl by Rafe Martin and David Shannon. Once, long ago, there was a village on the shores of Lake Ontario. Off from the other wigwams of this village stood one great, huge wigwam. Painted on the side were pictures of the sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, and animals. And inside this wigwam, there was said to be a, to live a group very great, rich, powerful, and supposedly handsome, invisible being. However, no one could, could see him except his sister, who lived there too. Many women wanted to marry the invisible being, but his sister said, Only the one who can see him 
can marry him. Now in the village, there lived a poor man who had three daughters. The two older daughters were cruel and hard-hearted, and they made their youngest sister sit by the fire and feed the flames. When the burning branches popped, the sparks fell on her. In time, her hands become burnt and scarred, her arms too rough and became scarred. And even her face was marked by the fire, and her beautiful long black hair hung ragged and charred. And those two older sisters laughed at her, saying, Ha! You're ugly, you rough-faced girl. And they made her life very lonely and miserable indeed. Sisters. One day, these two older sisters went to their father and said, Father, give us some new buckskin dresses. Give us some pretty beaded moccasins. We're going to marry the invisible bean. So the father gave them these things. Dressed in their finest, the two girls marched through the village. All the people pointed and stared. Look at those beautiful girls, they said. Surely they shall marry the invisible bean. And if those two girls were proud and hard-hearted before, they were even prouder now. They walked haughtily through the village. At last they came to the wigwam of the invisible bean. And there was his sister waiting. Two sisters walking through the village. And indeed, they do look very beautiful. On the outside, at least. Why have you come? The sister asked. We want to marry the invisible bean, they answered. That's why we're here. If you want to marry my brother, she replied, you have had to have seen him. Tell me, have you seen the invisible bean? Of course we've seen him, they insisted. Can't you see how pretty we are? Can't you see the beautiful clothes we wear? Oh yes, anyone can tell that we've truly seen the invisible bean. All right, she said quietly. If you think you've seen him, then tell me, what is his bow made of? And suddenly her voice had shifted as lightning and strong as thunder. Sister of the bean. His bow, they stammered in surprise. His uh bow, we know, we know. They turned desperately to one another and whispered, what shall we say? Let's say it's an oak tree. So they said, it's the great oak tree. No, said the sister of the invisible bean. No. Oh, she saw at once how they lied. Tell me, she continued, if you think you've seen my brother, the invisible bean, then what is the runner of his sled made of? Uh, we know, we know, cried the two sisters, but whispered fervently again, they wondered, what shall we say? What shall we say? Let's say it's the green willow branch. No, said the sister when she heard. No, you have not seen my brother. Now go home. Just test us fairly, they exclaimed. We've seen him. Just don't ask us all these silly questions. Two older sisters whispering together, trying to come up with some kind of answer. All right, said the sister of the invisible bean. Come with me. She took them back to the great wigwam and sat in their seats furthest from the entrance, the guest seats. Soon they heard footsteps coming along the path. Then something stepped inside. Though they heard breathing, the two sisters did not see a thing. Suddenly a great bow and a beaded quiver of arrows appeared in the air and were set down. But though the two girls sat there, their eyes wide, all through the night, they never saw a thing more. And in the morning, they had to go home, ashamed. See, two older sisters, and there's the invisible bean. They haven't seen him. The next day, the rough-faced girl went to her father and said, Father, may I please have some beads? May I please have a new buckskin dress and some pretty moccasins? I'm going to marry the invisible bean. For wherever I look, I see his face. 
But her father sighed. Daughter, he said, I'm sorry, I have no beads left for you. Only little broken shells. I have no buckskin dress. And as for moccasins, all I have left are for my own worn, cracked, and stretched out pair from last year. They're much too big. But she said, whatever you can spare, I can use. So he gave her these things. See the rough faced girl talking with her father and him presenting her with all that he could give since he already gave her two older sisters everything else. When she found the then she found dry reeds and taking a little broken shell, she strung a necklace. She stripped birch bark from the dead trees and made a cap, a dress and leggings. Then, with a sharp piece of bone, she carved in the bark pictures of the sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, and animals. She went down to the lake shore and soaked the moccasins in water until they grew soft. She molded them to her feet, but they were still too big, and they flapped, flapped, flapped like duck's feet as she walked. Then all the people came out of their wigwams and they pointed and stared. Look at the ugly girl, they laughed. Look at her strange clothes. Hey, 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 go home, you ugly girl. You'll never marry the invisible bee. It's not the kind thing to do. But the rough-faced girl had faith in herself and had courage. She didn't turn back, and she kept walking right through the village. The rough-faced girl came up with her own outfit to wear to present herself to an invisible being. <clears throat> As she walked, walked on, she saw the great beauty of the earth and the sky spreading before her. And truly, she alone of all of those in the village saw in those things the sweet yet handsome face of the invisible being. Can you see the face of the invisible bee? <clears throat> At last she came to the lake shore, just as the sun was sinking behind the hills, and many stars began to glitter out like fiery veil in the darkening sky overhead. And there, standing by the water's edge, was the sister of the invisible bee, waiting. Now the sister of the invisible bee was a wise woman. When she looked at you, she didn't just see your face, or your hair, or your clothes. No, when she looked at you, she looked you right in the eyes, and she could see all the way down to your heart. And she can tell if you had a good, kind heart, or a cold, hard, cruel one. When she looked at the rough-faced girl, she saw at once that though her skin was scarred, her hair burnt. Her clothes strange, she had a beautiful, kind heart. And so she welcomed her dearly, saying, Ah, my sister, why have you come? And the rough-faced girl replied, I've come to marry the invisible bee. The sister waiting for her at the lake's edge. Ah, said the sister very gently now. If you want to marry him, you have to have seen him. Tell me, have you seen my brother, the invisible being? And the rough-faced girl said, yes. All right then, said the sister. If you have seen him, tell me, what is his bow made of? The rough-faced girl said, his bow? Why, it's the great curve of the rainbow. Ah, exclaimed the sister in excitement. Tell me, she asked, if you have seen my brother, the invisible being, what is the runner of his sleigh made of? The rough-faced girl, looking up into the night sky, said, the runner of his sleigh? <laughs> Why, it's the spirit rope, the Milky Way of stars that is spread across the sky. cried this sister in wonder and delight. You have seen him. Come
come with me. Taking the rough-faced girl by the hand, she led her back to the great wigwam and sat her in the seat next to the entrance, the wife's seat. And they heard the footsteps coming along the path, closer and closer. The entrance flap of the wigwam lifted, and in stepped the invisible being. And when he saw her sitting there, he said, At last he's been found out. And smiling kindly, he added, And oh, my sister, she is beautiful. And his sister said yes. The rough-faced girl, seeing the invisible being. The sister of the invisible being then gave the rough-faced girl the finest buckskin robes and a necklace of perfect shells. Now bathe in the lake, she said, and dress in these. So the rough-faced girl bathed in the waters of the lake. Suddenly, all the scars vanished from her body. Her skin glowed smooth again, and her beautiful black hair grew in long and glossy as a raven's wing. Now everyone could see that she was indeed beautiful, but the invisible being and his sister had seen that from the start. She washed in the lake. She's, her outward appearance is matched what's on the inside of herself. Then at last, the rough-faced girl and the invisible being were married. They lived together in great gladness and were never parted. The end. Hope you enjoyed that one. All right. So you have a next one coming up. Um, this one was a surprise for me that I actually really enjoyed. Got this from the book festival we have here. And it's, it's just a wonderful little story to read. But it's called Zen Ghost. It's by John J. Muth. <clears throat> Michael, there's a ghost outside, said Carl. A what? asked Michael. Does that look like a ghost? Or do you think they're dressing up? Oh, Jesus. A big, scary-looking ghost, said Carl. Is it Stillwater? asked Michael. It doesn't have Stillwater's face, said Carl. Oh, wait. Yes, he does. Come in, Stillwater. Hi, Stillwater, said Addie. Happy almost Halloween. We're working on our costumes. I'm going to be the moon princess. What are you going to be? Maybe not Stillwater the panda. I'm a ghost, said Stillwater. What are you going to be? He asked Carl and Michael. I'm going to be a monster, said Carl, with a powerful heat ray and atomic breath. I'll cause awesome destruction. I haven't decided what I'm going to be yet, said Michael. Either an owl or a pirate. I really like owls. And I really like pirates. Talking to Michael and Carl. Perhaps you'll be an owl pirate, said Stillwater. You can't be an owl pirate, said Carl. There's no such thing as an owl pirate. He has to be one thing. I think that's true. Should he have to be one thing? He can be whatever he wants, said Addie. Look, Stillwater, do you like my costume? It's very true, Addie. Let's see her beautiful costume that she's showing off. Yes, said Stillwater. It reminds me of something. This is a very special Halloween. There's going to be a full moon, and I know someone who will tell you a ghost story. Yay, said Addie. I love ghost stories, said Michael. It's not too scary, is it? Asked Carl. What do you see Stillwater staring at? After trick-or-treating, meet me by the big stone wall, and I'll take you to the storyteller, said Stillwater. The author, 
trick-or-treating. See if you can see some, some spot, some awesome things with those trick-or-treaters. And maybe some that aren't quite costumes. When the children were done trick-or-treating, they waited by the stone wall. I'll trade you three tiny mints for one Snickers, said Addie. <laughs> no, said Carl. I'm not giving up my Snickers. But you don't even like them, said Addie. Come on. I only like tiny mints if they're the crunch peppermint kind, said Carl. Besides, I'm saving my Snickers. I have one flavored like bam, boo, said Stillwater. Wow, you scared me, said Carl. How long have you been there? Follow me. Oh, you did just come out of the darkness, huh? Gonna go off to the storyteller. I've never been this way before, said Michael. Me neither, said Carl. I think I have, said Addie. So they follow Stillwater. On to the storyteller. Do you see anything in the background? In a few moments, they arrived at Stillwater's house. It's very misty, said Addie. Come in, said Stillwater. So walk up to Stillwater's house. They all sat facing the front of the room. Then a panda, who looked exactly like Stillwater, came in and sat down. Is that Stillwater, whispered Carl? Yes? No? I don't know. Shh! whispered Michael. They sit down in front of the storyteller. There's still water, but there's also the storyteller that kind of looks like him too. The panda held up a brush and said, I'm going to draw you a story. Once, a long, long time ago, there was a young girl named Sanjo, and her parents loved her very much. They took very good care of her. She had a best friend named Ocho, whom she had known for as long as she could remember. They were together so much that Sanju's father had laughed and said, you two are so well matched. You'll probably end up marrying each other. As they grew up, they believed this would happen, and they fell in love. See. But when Sanju reached marrying age, her father suddenly became ill and couldn't work. He came to her one evening and told her that she was to wed a nice man named Henriel. Henriel was a prom... Uh, sorry, a prosper was prosperous and could take care of the family. Now Sanju was very sad. She had always hoped to marry her best friend Ocho. When Ocho heard about this, he decided to leave that very night. He couldn't stand to be in the same village where his beloved Sanju would marry someone else. At midnight, with the full moon, he secretly went to the, the river's edge and packed his boat and left. He didn't tell anyone, not even Sanju. As he traveled up the river, he saw a vague figure running through the bank. His heart leapt when he saw that Sanju, and he hurried to her side. They hugged each other tightly and decided to go off together. Sanju and Ocho journeyed to a faraway village where they married and had two children. They were very happy. Then one day Sanju came to Ocho in tears. She longed to be with her parents to see her home again. Ocho felt the same way. They decided to return together and face the consequences. I need to go back. When they arrived at the
The Dowager said, let me first see your father. I will apologize and found, find out how things are before you come. Sanju's father was very happy to see him. Mochua told him that they were sorry that they what they had done. They and Sanju were a family now, with two children. Sanju's father was astonished. What are you talking about, he asked. From the time you left the village, Sanju has been very sick in bed. She's been unable to speak. Nalja was surprised. But I promise you, Sanju is well. And you're a grandfather. I'll bring her to you. As Ochoa went to the dock, Sanju's father rushed to his daughter's side, bedside and told her that Ochoa had said. As she heard the story, she was filled with joy. Without saying a word, she rose from her bed and went quickly down the stairs. She's wearing a little bit of a different outfit than the Sanju that Ochoa knows. At that very moment, the Sanju had came, that had come ashore arrived at the house with Ochoa. The two Sanjus, upon seeing each other, merged and became one. See? The storyteller paused. Then he asked, Was Sanju is the true one? Are there one? Or are there two? Addie, Michael, and Carl looked at one another. Then they turned and looked beside them. Only a mask was sitting. At the they looked at Stillwater sitting in front of the room. He was reaching in the bag of Halloween candy. He's got a bunch of Whistlers and Tiny Mints. Does anyone have a bamboo flavored snookers? See? Remember, there were two. Now it's just one. Kind of like the story. I've been saving one for you, said Carl. It's Carl's getting that snookers, remember? Or snookers. Thank you, said Stillwater. Thank you, said Carl. That was a good story. And it was. They sit and enjoy the night. Alright, All right, everyone. Thank you for joining me for story time. I hope you enjoyed these wonderful legends and tall tales. Uh, I'll see you next week for story time. I'll post the new books that I, I've picked from that I'll read. Again, have a wonderful and safe um, weekend and Memorial Day weekend. And just hug each other and all the love. All right. Bye, everybody.